Act One of Mademoiselle de Belle Isle by Alexandre Dumas, translated by Francis N. Campbell, eighteen o nine to eighteen ninety three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personi. Five gentlemen of the court of Louis Fifteenth. The Duke de Richelieu. Read by Thomas Peter. The Duke de Mont. Read by Craig Franklin. The Chevalier d'Auvray. Read by Kurt. The Chevalier d'Aubigny. Read by Jason in Panama. Charmillac. Read by Alan Mapstone. The Abbe de Rosanne. Read by Todd. The Marchioness de Valcourt. Read by Sonia. Gabriella de Belle Isle. Read by Devora Allen. Mariette. Read by Lian Yao. Footman. Read by Roger Moline. Servant. Read by Owen Cook. Narrator. Read by Sandra Schmidt. The scene is in the palace of the Duke de Bourbon, at Chantilly, near Paris. Act One scene one the marchioness's dressing room she is seated at her toilet oh go on go on to the signature not one of these letters but i know its contents by heart beforehand your ladyship is vastly indifferent this morning why canst thou not see that all these professions of devoted love and eternal constancy are not half so much addressed to any poor personal merit of mine as to my supposed influence with his grace the duke of bourbon prime minister of his majesty burn child burn burn mariette reading monsieur de nocé burn monsieur de dura burn monsieur d'amont burn 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 here's lots of love all vanishing in smoke nothing from monsieur de richelieu nothing Heyo. really madam your ladyship must permit me to say that i feel quite anxious about you anxious and why pray why to tell you the truth madam you appear to me threatened with a serious attachment what to the duke de richelieu i'm in a fever about it take care madam people have died of love i believe Pshaw. poor mrs valens the upholster's wife i believe that kind of people do die of that sort of thing sometimes well if i were your ladyship i take some care however pray what makes thee suppose my case so dangerous all the symptoms madam for instance your ladyship's anxiety when monsieur de richelieu's letters don't arrive your indifference to whole heaps of other folks epistles a constancy of interest which as far as i can observe has lasted three whole weeks <laughs> three weeks eh really so long as that i believe you have only been in my service so long just so long my lady but that's a perfect lover's eternity and i really think your ladyship's complaint has reached the highest pitch of danger i only hope it ain't catching i could astonish thee much more were i to tell thee oh what madam how inquisitive you are child i hope your ladyship will excuse me but it is so long since i've had the pleasure of being astonished at anything enter a servant an ecclesiastic the abbe de rosanne desires to know when your ladyship would allow him an audience hey the abbe de rosanne oh admit him admit him instantly and do you mariette leave me for the present exit mariette how many years have passed since i have seen him how full of strange events those years have been and now i who have struggled for so long unaided in this sea of difficulties find at the very moment of utter discouragement the friend the counsellor the guide of my early youth enter servant and monsieur de rosanne 
may an obscure and humble individual of my grave calling be permitted to trespass for a few moments madam upon your time and attention he does not know me he actually does not know me i am aware that my dress and manner must form a strange and discordant contrast to those of your usual solicitors madam and that a poor country curate will probably commit more than one conventional sin while addressing the brilliant marchioness de valcourt the presiding divinity of a gay court the mistress of the prime minister of france no 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 not from you that title which however in your eyes alone probably degrades me is it possible you have forgotten elise de varenne your pupil at the convent of st cyr in those happy happy days when you were my confessor and i had so little to confess good heavens mademoiselle de varennes the duke of bourbon's niece <laughs> therefore most certainly not his mistress even so my dear dear abbe but how when where oh sit down sit down and let me again pour my confession into your ear and receive the consolation of your sympathy the benefit of your advice you remember that just at the time when you were appointed to the distant mission whence i have only returned within these few days after ten years absence from my native land i a child of scarce fourteen years was betrothed to monsieur de fronsac himself only sixteen now the too notorious duke de richelieu i returned after the ceremony to my convent my husband to the superintendence of his tutor under whose care he was to travel and finish his education till such time as we were considered old enough to fulfil the contract we had entered into tis a foolish custom a foolish custom and has bred more mischief and misery than virtue or happiness i fear go on my dear daughter how the four years prescribed were spent by him i know not but alas can well imagine by me father they were spent in one blissful dream of the happiness that awaited me the fair youthful face and form of my boy husband perpetually flitted before my fancy and every day told me that time was but maturing his graces and perfecting his mind so passed those four long years to me in joyful anticipation of my future fate judge oh judge of the bitterness of my disappointment of the anguish shame and indignation i felt when within a week of the time appointed for the solemnization of our marriage the realization of all those happy happy visions go on my dear child no at the bare recollection of the cruel insult my emotion chokes me even now within a week i say of the day when my husband should have claimed me i received from him this letter here it is oh here it is i have worn it like a hardening talisman against my heart from that moment and i sometimes think it has turned my very heart to stone rosanne reads mademoiselle a contract entered into when we were both of us children and utterly unable to judge or choose for ourselves cannot i am persuaded appear binding in the eyes of a person of the excellent judgment i am told you possess it is therefore i am sure as much for your satisfaction as my own that i propose relieving you and myself from the absurd obligations which have been thrust upon us by others a divorce will be easily and speedily obtained and i flatter myself mademoiselle that this step will prove the sincerity with which i remain your very obedient humble servant richelieu poor child poor child your eyes are filled with tears you feel this bitter blow this withering mortification for me oh but years have passed since then and i have led such a life and lived among such people and seen such things that my tears never come out of my heart now and i laugh all day long at everything for existence itself has become a jest and a mockery to me 
This is terrible indeed. But how came this divorce not to take place? Because I fell mortally sick upon this very blow, and at one time of my illness was supposed dead. Monsieur de Richelieu was informed of the fortunate circumstance of my demise. And when I recovered, I hadn't the heart to have him undeceived. You see, my dear Abbé, dying was more convenient even than divorcing, and saved a world of trouble. And since then? Since then, become of age and inheriting an independent fortune, I determined to follow the course of this very man, my husband, for he is my husband still, and for now six years I have known all the details of a life whose reckless profligacy may have wearied heaven, but has not destroyed my love. You love this man? Alas, with all my soul! There is no transformation, no disguise, no assumption that I have not undergone to follow him in all the tortuous path where he deigns to walk. Disgusted, indignant, heart-sick, spirit-weary, I have been ready to die with grief and shame at his proceedings. Nevertheless, sometimes I have been the means of healing those wounds he had inflicted. Sometimes I have interposed between his fatal arts and women about to fall victims to them. I have spared him some crimes. I have, as far as I could, atoned for those I could not prevent. I have done some good to him, for him. O oh, father, I do not regret the agony I have suffered while thus struggling to reclaim my husband. Bless you, my dear, dear child, and heaven will bless you and will crown your efforts with success. But how, in the name of wonder, is that I find you here, in your uncle's palace, and, stranger than all, under the title of his mistress? The singular life I was leading, the profuseness of my expenditure, my isolated position, and some poor remains of personal beauty, which all this sorrow had not destroyed, made me soon an object of curiosity and observation. I found my situation become every day more difficult and dangerous, and at length I had recourse to my uncle, who, in common with the world and my most affectionate husband, believed me dead. I see. He received you and kept your secret. Exactly. But the world not being prone to give men and women credit for perfectly disinterested friendship, and Paris being especially little favourable to platonic attachments, the natural inference became that I was the Duke's mistress. The name you have assumed? Oh, yes, I know. Might belong to anybody or anything. Valcourt, Belcourt, to be sure, may stand for anything one pleases. But pray remember, Monsieur l'Abbé, that it is the very few people's business and nobody's interest here to trouble their heads about my calling. I am sorry you should have lent yourself to a situation involving such a scandal, nevertheless. Scandal, my dear Abbé? To be sure, you have been ten years in the colonies, and may be pardoned your innocence. Why, I am considered the most virtuous as well as the most charming of women, my supposed protector being prime minister. I assure you, not only all the nobles of the court, but all their wives are at my feet. And as for the churchmen, my levies are thronged with bishops, my assemblies with archbishops, and as for curé and abbé, I beg your pardon, my dear friend, they positively cost me a fortune in wax lights. They make my rooms so dark with their black livery, the only grave thing about them, believe me, and, to be sure, they do all they can by the liveliness, not to say looseness, of their conversation, to atone for the gloominess and stiffness of their costume. And Monsieur de Richelieu still suspects? Nothing. He has become my most intimate friend, and now, nothing loath, brings me the confidence which formerly I was forced to surprise. Tis a curious position, let me tell you, that of a wife who is her husband's unknown confidant. It seems strange to me that he has never addressed you as a lover. Instinct, depend upon it. 
he would i have no doubt if i had not been his wife how have you the heart to jest i've positively no heart left for anything else besides in the life i lead and a short observation will convince you of the fact laughing has often precisely the signification of tears and sighs when one's tired of the one one takes to the other and it still means the same thing and lips that have exhausted the relief of complaint will utter the pleasantest jests upon their own misery it's only one way of easing one's heart believe me and the heart must be eased some way you know or break enter a servant the duke de richelieu wishes to be permitted the honour of waiting upon her ladyship the duke de richelieu his grace has only this moment arrived from paris and wishes to know if her ladyship is visible oh certainly admit him now my dear abbe will you stay and see how admirably i carry on this sad farce no indeed for i am not as well bred as your ladyship and would surely betray myself or you or both of us you have postponed your suit to the duke de bourbon's mistress in listening to elise de varenne's story never mind you are sure of my interest and you have no idea how immense that is pray remain in the palace while you stay in chantilly i cannot afford to lose you again it is too great a luxury to have a friend and i shall ever be yours most devotedly exit enter the duke de richelieu how charming of you to receive me so kindly even in my boots i am always charmed to see you my dear duke whatever your costume so you are just come from paris i arrived ten minutes ago and what have you been doing here ah uh, nothing worth being told the duke has hunted a good deal and i have received petitions i envy the people that ask and receive favours from you oh my dear duke a truce i thought it was agreed that there was to be no superfluous gallantry between us true and though i am sometimes vehemently tempted to break the compact and make violent love to you you are such a capital friend that i verily believe i should lose by making you my mistress your friend you certainly would that's the common cause of things you know i thought dore was at chantilly so he is i wonder what brings him here is he come officially as lieutenant of my lord's marshals to balk some duel not that i am aware of did he come alone daumont came with him no really the dear daumont uncombed and unshaved as usual i suppose upon my soul he is the slovenliest nobleman in france so paris would not let you go and the five days for which you went grew into a whole week well it was not a week little enough to pay my court to our young king after my two years dreary exile at vienna oh yes and then you know you had to see madame de villard madame de durat madame de villeroy madame de sabran madame de mouchy mademoiselle de charolais madame de soubise madame de upon my life it's true i didn't think there were so many but as so many duties compel me to remain i did not doubt that if anything of importance took place here you would be good enough to write me a line by the by do you never write to anybody it's curious enough that in spite of our delightful intimacy i haven't a line of your handwriting i don't even know it by sight that's rather an unadvised speech for a diplomatist my lord can the favourite of a prime minister indulge in an intimate correspondence especially with such a one as monsieur de richelieu handwriting is a dangerous thing in your grace's possession sometimes we know and how goes it with your faithful adorer Delmont? <laughs> indeed i don't know whether it's love of me but he certainly is half crazy oh my dear lady you wrong him by half but pray tell me who is the young officer on guard downstairs this morning a protege of your ladyship's of mine sir 
Ah, don't look cross. I didn't mean to be rude or inquisitive, you know. Only, he's a devilish handsome fellow, that's all. I believe he has lately been promoted through the interest of the Duke de Bourbon. What's his name? Daubigny, I believe. Daubigny. Daubigny. Good name. Good family. People from Brittany, I think. Oh, uh, but by the by, my dear, delightful marchioness, talking of Brittany, I'm distractedly in love. <laughs> Indeed? What, again? Since when? Oh, since the day before yesterday. Now, just imagine the loveliest creature. It isn't absolutely necessary that I should hear her personal description, is it, my lord? Oh, no. Not if it bores you. Well, however, she's from Brittany. And you met her? First at the Archbishop's, then at the King's Assembly. Oh, I see. Some new lavalier. Not a bit of it. You're quite mistaken. A gentlewoman of high family, who has come to Paris to solicit the freedom of her father and brothers, who are prisoners in the Bastille. The Archbishop referred her to the King, and the King referred her to the Duc de Bourbon, so that she came here this very morning, an hour before I myself arrived. She is here? Yes. Isn't it charming? Oh, uh, very. But what is to be the result of all this? Upon my soul, that's more than I can tell. But I've a notion it may turn out pleasantly. You have forgotten one thing, however, the name of your fair petitioner. Mademoiselle de Belle-Isle. What? The granddaughter of Fouquet? The very same. But the father is compromised in that Leblanc business, and the sons are accused of assassination. Lord bless us, yes. I know those things are said about people in order to get them into the Bastille. The accusations are even believed as long as they are out of it. And when they are fairly trapped, they are left there. And the whole business is not only disbelieved, but never thought about by anyone again. I'll tell you what, my dear Marchioness. I don't know whether it is because I have twice been in the Bastille myself, but I really have a most sincere commiseration for those people who are sent there particularly the second time. Enter a servant. Mademoiselle de Belle-Isle. Why do you announce visitors without knowing whether I choose to receive anyone? Her ladyship had said this morning that... Oh, yes. But I did not wish to see everybody that came. Now, my dear, dear Marchioness, I beseech you. Oh, certainly. I can refuse your grace nothing. Admit the lady. You're a perfect angel. My part in this business is a charming one, I must say. Mademoiselle de Belle-Isle. Enter Mademoiselle de Belle-Isle. Madame. Pray approach, Mademoiselle. How kind of you, Madame, to receive me thus upon my first presenting myself at your door. I do not deserve your acknowledgments, Mademoiselle. They are due to His Grace, the Duke de Richelieu. The Duke de Richelieu. He assured me that the business upon which you came was most pressing and could not be postponed. A thousand thanks, then, first to his grace. I had already been fortunate enough to find him on my way to Versailles, whose gates were opened to me by his influence. It seems that he is still my good angel at Chantilly. But let me also thank you, madame, whose gracious reception augurs so well for my success. You must now tell me in what I can be useful to you. My name has informed you who I am, and this intrusion must explain how urgent is the favour I solicit. My father, madame, and my two brothers have now been prisoners three years in the Bastille. My father, the venerable head of a noble house, accused of fraud, embezzlement. My brothers, gentlemen and soldiers, implicated in a charge of murder. Oh, madame, you must see yourself at once that these things cannot be true, and yet for three long years have I remained alone to console and support my mother, vainly hoping that justice would at last be granted them. At length my mother died, and I found myself alone in the wide world, on one hand a prison, on the other a grave. 
Then, madame, I set forth alone to seek redress under the safeguard of my misfortunes. And what was your intention? To see the Archbishop de Freus, to throw myself at the king's feet. Well? Well, madame, I have been denied redress alike by both. By the Archbishop, because he said political affairs in no way concerned him. By the king, who, engrossed by the pleasures of his age, is ignorant even of the existence of those who are persecuted in his name. At length I was sent hither, to present my petition to the Duc de Bourbon, and I determined to appeal to you, madame. Why? Because you are a woman. Because, terrified at my lonely and unprotected position, a stranger at court, and unused to all its observances, trembling at every moment, lest I should commit some imprudence, or be guilty of some breach of etiquette, I felt as if I should be safe at once, could I but appeal to the feelings of a woman. And you were very right, madam. Her ladyship will do everything in her power for you, I dare be sworn. Servant, announcing. His Grace the Duke d'Aumont, the Chevalier d'Auvray. The devil take them both. You see, madam, in spite of the interest which I cannot but feel for you, I am under the necessity of receiving company. Some other time we will resume this conversation. Some other time? Oh, madame, shall I ever find you again thus gracious and condescending? Good heavens, I have yet so much to urge that would convince your mind and touch your heart. Who can assure me that I shall be permitted to see you even some other time, and that before to-morrow the persecutors of my wretched family may not have made me an enemy in her whom I implore to-day as my redeeming angel? Really, I am very much embarrassed. I should be too happy to give you my undivided attention, but... Well, my dear Marchioness, there is one way of arranging this business. Retire to your own apartment with Mademoiselle, and I will receive these gentlemen. Your Grace is really too obliging. Pray do the honours for me, and do you, Mademoiselle, accompany me where we shall be uninterrupted. Heaven surely inspired me when I sought you, madame, and heaven will reward you both, for my poor thanks are all I have to offer. Exit with Madame de Valcourt. Nothing can be better. I release the father and the brothers from the Bastille, as a good action is never unrewarded. I shall have my reward, or there is no such thing as justice extant. Show in the gentlemen. They come in. Good morning, Duke. Good morning. Ah, my dear Chevalier, I have not seen you, I think, since the day when the Count Emmanuel of Bavaria and myself were just going to cut each other's throats, and you interfered and arrested me. Yes, Faith, arrested me, and by order of our Lords Marshals of France. Here is my hand. I owe you no grudge for it. You're of a forgiving disposition, and I can understand your owing me no grudge for saving you some ugly gash or other. But the question is whether we shall forgive you for being here, tete-a-tete -tete for the last hour with the marchioness, while we are not admitted even to kiss the hem of her petticoat. Pray. Has she delegated her powers to you, and are you to treat with us instead of the fair lady? Precisely. And I shall profit by my present dignity, and give you, Damon, a piece of advice. Well, what is it? Now, my dear fellow, it pleased God to make you a nobleman of the first family. It pleased the king to create you duke and peer of the realm. The Duchess of Orléans got your ribbon for you. Your wife had you made captain in the guards. I installed you knight of St. Louis, for by that same token I had to kiss you at that august ceremony. Now, seeing that so much has been done for you by others, do, my dear fellow, shave your chin and do something for yourself. What absurd stuff! This was the way we all wore our beards during the Regency, and it was thought charming then we have not changed but the women have got some new freak in their heads about us the devil take all fashions everybody hasn't been blessed like you with the faculty of conforming to every whim of the hour nobody but fronsac could have become richelieu but i think even you will be puzzled to follow the prevailing fashion of the day 
the improved morality of society as our philosophers say pray my dear dovray are our ladies really become so terribly virtuous as i am told they are it's incredible but a most melancholy truth formerly as you know the universal custom was that a woman had one confessor and two lovers at a time now would you believe it they've reversed the fashion and they have only one lover and two chaplains it's really a frightful state of society come nonsense you always take gloomy views of things upon my soul it's true he has it from the best authority too his own wife no you mistake domo i had it from yours then it's sure to be true how unfortunate i am to be deprived of such authentic sources of information wretched widower you a widower why when were you married so long ago that i have almost forgotten it where is your wife um i don't exactly know sweet creature lovely woman died in a convent before we could even be divorced it's a melancholy story i'll tell it to you some other time servant announcing the chevalier d'aubigny aha my young officer comes to pay his court to the fair marchioness too upon my word he is a good-looking chap and i suspect so you see that as far as you are concerned the very occupation of your life's gone the bread's taken out of your mouth as one may say and i heartily advise you to return to vienna for you may depend upon it there's nothing to be done here speak for yourselves gentlemen oh we speak for all that's a point upon which i am not at all so certain upon my soul richelieu you have come back from vienna a more impudent coxcomb than you went the women there have actually wrought that miracle upon you you'd better go back there believe me the game's up here enter madame de valcourt with rosanne followed by a servant carrying her mass book a thousand pardons gentlemen i have been unexpectedly detained till now and i really now must go to mass to-morrow we have a ball at the palace and shall be happy to see you all madame madame de valcourt to richelieu come back in an hour i must speak with you i shall not fail and does not your ladyship intend receiving us to-morrow morning to console us in some degree for our ill fortune to-day <laughs> impossible my dear chevalier i accompany the duke to paris to-morrow morning and shall only return in time for the ball the duc de bourbon is invited to rambouillet to join the king's hunt i understand oh yes he is in higher favour there than ever the archbishop's scale is light and threatens to kick the beam so that we are still king of france we, we kiss, kiss the, the hand, hand of your majesty. majesty come monsieur l'abbé how do you think i carry it most wonderfully they all kiss her hand she curtsies and goes out now just look there what were we telling you richelieu there goes madame de valcourt de masse with her priest on one side and her prayer-book on the other i declare the women are possessed with the devil of devotion in spite of which come now a wager what is it i'm in want of a thousand louis Domon is too miserly to lend them you are too prodigal to have them now i'll win five hundred from each of you in a fair wager with all my heart and mine you both insist that during my absence the women have all become furiously virtuous it is our sincere and very sad opinion very well now mind Domon, mind d'ovray i bet i duke de richelieu that i will obtain a private interview of the very first maid wife or widow that we see either here or as we leave the palace and that within the next four-and-twenty hours stop a bit let's be precise if you please a love meeting 
my dear fellow i leave all other meetings to my men of business a rendezvous then a rendezvous and where shall it take place why in the lady's chamber if you like at what time midnight if that suits you and how shall the thing be proved nothing easier in life i'll throw a note out at the window myself to you done done now you understand perfectly a woman the first maid wife or widow that we see either in the palace or as relieved oh on one condition however the lady must be handsome oh certainly here look 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 gentlemen here comes a woman through the gallery mademoiselle de belle passes to the back of the stage mademoiselle de belle aha this doesn't look so promising eh richelieu i'm afraid you don't feel so sure of our money gentlemen i shall win it depend on it a thousand louis then daubigny coming forward one moment gentlemen i'll hold the stakes if you please you sir with your grace's permission and why may one ask because gentlemen i have a small interest in this wager too in three days i was to marry that lady whom his grace of richelieu has undertaken to dishonour within the four-and-twenty hours end of the first act Act Two of Mademoiselle de Belle Isle by Alexandre Dumas, translated by Francis N. Campbell, eighteen o nine to eighteen ninety three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One, the same scene as in the first act. Enter Madame de Valcourt and Richelieu and you have laid such a wager even so what madness i've no reputation for wisdom to lose your wager's lost depend upon it i have yet till to-morrow morning at eleven o'clock it's only now just five in the afternoon who betted against you who held the stakes i'll tell you all that when i've won now you must keep your promise what promise to assist me in my undertaking oh, good heavens but if i could have conceived however oh no backing out i depend upon you well you may do so it's very strange you say that in such an odd sort of way <laughs> dear me what sort of way of course i shall keep my word well good-bye i'm off to reconnoitre my ground where does she lodge at the sun a good house kept by a worthy old rascal whose forefathers have plundered ours time out of mind and who now treads in his ancestors steps most conscientiously i can make him do anything i please you will be back soon for the duke de bourbon has dispatches for you this morning oh yes besides i must tell you how the affair prospers adieu exit oh, how the affair prospers i'm glad his grace has so fairly taken me into his alliance on this occasion however <laughs> depends upon me for assistance too as well as sympathy at any rate I can promise him quite as much of the one as the other. Enter Monsieur de Rosanne. Well, what do you think of this wager? I am petrified at such cold-blooded prolificacy. Doubtless, madam, you were unable to restrain your just indignation, and overwhelmed his grace with merited reproaches. <laughs> so far from any such thing, my dear Abbé, I listened to him with the most cordial interest and have moreover promised to assist him with all my power some indirectness may be pardoned in so difficult a situation as yours but then of course you will warn this interesting young lady no such thing she is far too interesting 
too innocent too sacredly free from knowledge or even suspicion of evil to be shocked by any such revelations no she shall know none of the dangers that surround her and yet she shall escape them all or wit courage and cunning shall have forsaken me for ever the duke shall lose his wager my dear abbe and that charming young creature shall never know of how vile an attempt she has been made the object my spirit is roused alike by the difficulty of my enterprise and its interest i promise you we shall obtain a glorious victory and my scapegrace husband shall yet acknowledge that there are women in the world who are true to themselves and loyal to each other mademoiselle de belle -Ile. oh most fortunate show her in i leave you my dear madam you wear an air of triumph already that it makes me almost sure of your success heaven grant our hopes their full accomplishment exit enter mademoiselle de belle -Ile. come my dear child pardon this early intrusion madame but my anxiety is uncontrollable have you seen the duc de bourbon i have but my application to him on your behalf was far from successful oh heavens the duke is strongly prejudiced i am sorry to say against your family unfortunate that i am oh madame would heaven but inspire me with the power of convincing you i am convinced my dear already but that is not the question monsieur de bourbon you see stay a moment an idea occurs to me there is a person who has the greatest influence over him who if he would but take up your affair i am sure would succeed in carrying it through triumphantly oh who where how can i find this person tell me that i may fly oh you need not fly child he is here at chantilly but by the by what am i thinking of you know him it is monsieur de richelieu then indeed i am sure of success his goodness to me at versailles and here madame this morning if you remember the extreme kindness of his manner oh yes i remember well your best way will be to write to him how very fortunate i have had the very same idea myself you advise me to write to him madame and i have already done so bless me have you sent the letter oh no madame i have brought it to you to request you to look at it to ask you whether you think it proper that i should solicit an interview with monsieur de richelieu madame de valcourt aside charming creature i am half in love with my own rival aloud certainly my dear child the sacredness of your motive shields you from all ill interpretation i thought it might do so madame besides you may if you please appoint him here in this very apartment oh if you would but permit it where can i send to him oh madame how kind how good how considerate you are but bless me how came i not to think of it before how inconsiderate i have been you are alone at chantilly i think you told me alas madame quite alone staying at an hotel alone why my dear that is in itself a most objectionable situation for a young woman of family you cannot possibly stay alone in a hotel alas madame i know nobody at chantilly forgetful except myself now when i undertake a business my dear it is my principle to see it through and that successfully too i have pledged myself to your cause and i am determined to gain it for you and as the first step in the matter we will besiege monsieur de bourbon i will introduce the enemy into the citadel you shall lodge here what have i done to deserve so much kindness i who trembled at the bare thought of demanding your protection but indeed my dear madame i cannot put you to so much inconvenience <laughs> inconvenience nonsense child you shall have these two rooms and a small library adjoining i shall simply install myself in the suite of apartments beyond that's all 
and we shall be next door to each other and excellent neighbours i am sure oh madame good heavens if you could but know what balm your kindness pours into my heart oh i feel so sure so sure that if you but will it all things will turn out fortunately for me i hope i have made a good beginning and when we are once fairly leagued and side by side it shall go hard my fair petitioner if we do not repair all past misfortunes and prevent all future ones but let us lose no time return to your hotel and have all your things brought here immediately she rings mariette enters see if one of the carriages is ready go with mademoiselle to her lodging and remain to assist her in the meantime my dear i shall send your note to the duke how can i thank you attempts to kiss her hand nonsense what are you about kisses her forehead you will find me here when you come back exeunt mademoiselle de belle and mariette upon my word i know nothing half so imprudent as a young girl's gratitude by simply changing two words in this letter monsieur de richelieu <laughs> with the excellent opinion he has of himself would presently discover what certainly was never meant in it my dear husband you were gallantly complaining just now that you did not know my handwriting so much the better for we shall very probably have a long correspondence together under cover of mademoiselle de belle i shall go and rewrite this dangerous epistle forthwith exit enter richelieu my tavern keeper is either stupid or what's worse honest i'm not sure that he understood me or he is an accomplished assumer of innocence if i only knew her room there might be some condemned door the greatest conveniences in life are those same condemned doors by the by i wonder if our gay marchioness knows anything of the past behind the tapestry that monsieur de bourbon so ingeniously contrived for himself years ago in this very room let's see let's see the marchioness is a very strange woman hereabouts i think it was and though the acknowledged favourite of the prime minister or hereabouts or and a woman of decided talent she does not seem to take half the advantage of her admirable position that she might and many women would for instance the secret door oh, where the devil is it enter madame de valcourt ah oh, my dear duke what are you about with my poor old tapestry richelieu aside i wonder now if she does know the door she looks so confoundedly unconscious aloud nothing oh nothing i was admiring this part of the work gobelin magnificent <laughs> but my dear marchioness i am in high spirits well come i will put you in still better humour mademoiselle de belle has just left me she had been looking everywhere for you and not finding you requested me to give you this note good gracious you amaze me what does she want i rather think an interview with you how very lucky i was about to ask one with her you see good fortune flies to meet you and to whom am i indebted for this happy chance oh to your own merit of course in the first place then i rather think she has been told that you had great influence with monsieur de bourbon and she wants you to employ it in her behalf too happy upon my life to do anything for her and do you know i have spoken to him about the business already but i found him very ill disposed about it will you excuse me one moment i am going to give this room up to a friend and must have some measures taken about it don't mind me my dear marchioness exit madame de valcourt and now let's see what mademoiselle de belle has to say to me reads would his grace the duc de richelieu have the condescension to bestow upon mademoiselle de belle at his earliest convenience the favour of a few moments conversation 
the favour will be mine mine charming creature upon my soul these rustic beauties have the loveliest simplicity of style mademoiselle de belle ventures to hope that she has not reckoned in vain upon his grace's kind protection in return for which she promises him boundless gratitude it's a bargain my charming petitioner you shall have my protection and i your boundless gratitude <laughs> let's see let's see somehow this note is written in a remarkably clear and steady hand hmm. Hmm. Mm, there's something in madame de velcourt's manner too in all this business which seems to me rather suspicious stop a bit richelieu my friend don't be taken in if you can help it the marchioness gave me this note let us make sure that mademoiselle belle really wrote it here she is why damn it the girl sees with a trembling at sight of me enter mademoiselle de belle -Ile. pardon me my lord duke but I cannot command the emotion which your presence excites in me. And how may I interpret this emotion, madam? Tis most natural, and easily to be accounted for, my lord. I cannot look upon you without thinking that you are perhaps the man destined to end all my misfortunes. Can it be chance alone that seems to have brought you back from Vienna, as it were, on purpose to assist me, first at Versailles, and now at Chantilly? The unfortunate are apt to be superstitious, my lord, and perhaps you yourself are not exempt from some slight belief in presentiments? I believe in them firmly, and have done so, particularly for the last three days, and shall be cruelly disappointed if mine do not prove true. The Marchioness was good enough, I believe, to deliver a note to your grace. Which she informed me was from you. I am infinitely obliged to Madame de Velcourt, for, of course, she suggested to you the idea of applying to me. No, my lord Duke. I will be candid with you. I had thought of addressing your grace before I spoke to her. You must blame yourself for my importunity. I could not believe that you would refuse to fulfill hopes which your own gracious condescension excited. Ah, my lord, you are all-powerful here. You know the object of my entreaties, the freedom of my father and my brothers. The salvation of a noble family is in your hands. No exertion shall be wanting on my part. Believe it, madam, in order that your filial devotion may find its just reward. But you mistake. I am not all-powerful here, and what you demand depends upon a higher will than mine. I can but be the mediator between beauty and power. But give me a written memorial of your petition. Write it yourself, even as you speak, with the same enchanting eloquence of feeling, the same irresistible soul and I will present it myself to the Duc de Bourbon this very day. Enter Footman. The dispatches which His Grace was waiting for are ready. A thousand pardons. I must leave you for an instant. Here is everything necessary for writing. Sit down and drop your petition. In three minutes I will return for it. How shall I ever thank you as I ought? By allowing me the title of your friend. Oh, my Lord Duke. Right, my dear madam, right. The devil's in it if I don't find out so, whether she wrote that note or not. Exeunt, Duke and Footman. Good heavens, how deceived have I been in my notion of the court! How was I warned that I should meet with nothing but envy, malice, and wickedness? I have only yet applied to two persons, and one is as a dear friend, and the other as a brother to me. Enter Madame de Valcourt. What are you doing, child? Oh, is it you? You see, I am making out a memorial to the Prime Minister, by the direction of Monsieur de Richelieu, who is coming back for it immediately, and has undertaken to present it himself. Madame de Valcourt aside. Oh, oh. he suspects something, I see. Aloud. Let me see, my dear, how you said about it. Oh, this will never do. There are certain forms of expression usual in these sort of petitions. Here, get up. I'll do it for you. Are you not afraid, madame, that the Duc de Bourbon may recognize your hand? <laughs> well, child, suppose he does. Do you think that is likely to injure your cause? Come, give me your place. Now, what are your father's names? Charles Louis Auguste de Fouquet. His titles? Duke of Gisors, Marquis of Belle Isle, Earl Vernon, and Andely. 
what is your brother's rank one is captain and the other lieutenant in the king's service how long have they been in confinement my father for three years my brothers for the last fifteen months very good we will set all these poor prisoners free depend upon it oh madame god grant you may speak true now my dear there is your petition properly drawn up enter mariette mademoiselle de belle isle's bedchamber is entirely ready madam whenever she chooses to take possession of it very well exit enter richelieu he stops at the door together huh. <gasps> the duke sits down and reads a thousand pardons i am afraid i have kept you waiting no excuses my lord pray the petition is but this moment finished and now if you will take charge of it certainly aside looking at it the same handwriting the note was from her aloud i hope madam you will permit me to come and inform you to-day of the success our petition meets with you must ask the marchioness sir it is her permission you must obtain since she has been good enough to give me a lodging in the palace as long as i remain in chantilly she actually has had the goodness to give up her own apartment to me ah really indeed so marchioness the friend you were expecting was mademoiselle de belle isle my dear duke you must perceive i am sure at once yourself how extremely improper and even imprudent it was for a young lady in her position alone and unprotected to remain at a hotel oh certainly certainly and you were quite right my dear lady and it really is very kind and considerate of you but i hope i may be permitted nevertheless to inform mademoiselle de belle of the fate of my attempts in her favour bless me of course she is at home here and i hope will feel herself so and receive you whenever she thinks proper then madam i entreat that favour once more of you come when you will sir your grace will ever be looked for as a friend and welcomed as a benefactor i may not be able to see the duc de bourbon till rather late i have watched through many a night of tears and terror believe me it will cost me little to watch for once in hope and happy expectation this evening then madam i shall wait upon you this evening sir i shall look for you most anxiously it is possible that what i may have to repeat to you would be better confided to yourself alone my lord duke i will take care to be alone <laughs> you are too charming mademoiselle de belle isle goes into the bedroom madame de valcourt aside i wonder how many wives would have sat quietly through such an assignation i positively cannot but admire my own heroism and self-command a modern fine lady is your only stoic so so marchioness this is the way you keep the promise you made me of remaining new to this business you defeat my very first plan <laughs> oh a plan founded on the rascality of a tavern-keeper fie it really was too easy and would have disgraced your generalship here now tis quite another matter there can be neither surprise nor treachery and your grace will be compelled to obtain for it will be impossible to steal the lady's favour nor have i the slightest doubt in the world of your obtaining it my dear duke nor i either to tell you the truth my dear marchioness provided only that your ladyship will fight fairly as i do <laughs> and pray what do you demand as fair fighting of me that you will keep my secret in the first place that at ten o'clock you will leave mademoiselle de belle isle and that in short from ten o'clock till midnight mademoiselle de belle isle will be left entirely alone for me she most certainly will for i am going to paris this evening myself and shall therefore be entirely out of the way of interfering with any of your plans but i must now if you please state two conditions in this agreement nothing can be fairer you will employ no servant of the palace in the business you will have recourse to no drugs or opiates 
as it is whispered you have done more than once on such occasions my lord duke and these points acceded to on your part i leave your grace an open field and my best wishes aside for your defeat which i will take care to make certain you have my word to all this and i wish your ladyship a pleasant drive to court you still persist in your plan then though i have passed over to the enemy i think more desperate battles have been won <laughs> and against better generals no doubt <laughs> by no means i do not say that for in you my dear marchioness i am perfectly aware that i have to encounter youth combined with experience madame de valcourt aside oh that would be bitter if it were true aloud farewell till to-morrow evening then madame de valcourt curtsies to him and goes out she does not know the secret door that's quite clear and i have nothing to do but rummage certain reminiscences to find my way to it once more how droll now that a clever woman should live as she has done close to such an inestimable contrivance and be none the better for it the marchioness is a handsome woman a very handsome woman in fact the wager aside she is a devilish deal better worth besieging than even this pretty girl she pretends to be a prude too and that's always rare sport faith i half think she must be something of the kind never to have discovered this ha here it is and no more fastening than a few minutes perseverance will suffice to make away with excellent faith and now my two fair antagonists i think your defeat was certainly laid down in your horoscope for upon my soul i don't see how you can avoid it exit enter madame de valcourt and mademoiselle de belle my dear child i have been thinking very seriously of the tedious cause of solicitation which i am afraid you will be compelled to resort to in this sad business oh madame my patience shall be proof against everything poor thing how much this courageous resignation touches me is it long since you have seen your old father alas three years not once since he was thrown into prison three years and you have never demanded permission to be admitted to him oh madame i have besought entreated supplicated in vain in vain can you conceive such cruelty to refuse a child admission to her wretched father's prison all those whom i wearied with my prayers doubtless had no children or they must have felt for me <laughs> you would rejoice to see your father once again oh heavens and if any one procured you that happiness they might depend upon your secrecy good god what are you saying what hope do you venture to suggest what i i might behold my father once again enter when he least expected at his prison door at the very moment perhaps when he was thinking of me far away i might throw myself in his arms crying out father it is i dear dear father it is your child your gabrielle oh speak speak for pity's sake on my knees i implore you what shall i do to obtain this joy this blessing madame de valcourt raising her listen take heed that we are dealing now with matters of the utmost weight and danger the governor of the bastille is my devoted friend and i can give you a letter for him a letter yes yes and with that letter you shall see your father again it will take you less than two hours and a half to go to paris you will set off at ten you will arrive at a little after midnight you will remain till three in the morning with monsieur de belle and you will be back here before any one in the palace is stirring what to-day to-night this very night i shall see my father whom i have not seen for three whole years oh heaven support me i feel as if the sudden shock of happiness would drive me mad but now attend and mark me all this can only be on one most solemn condition remember what i am doing for you i take upon myself to open to you a state prison which uncloses its gates at the voice of the prime minister or the king's signet alone 
i have done this for no human being but yourself monsieur de bourbon must remain ignorant of it jealous as he is of his authority he would never forgive my assumption of it in such a matter monsieur de belle isle's imprisonment is of the strictest the severest kind his liberty hereafter perhaps his life depends upon your secrecy great god his life yes his life therefore swear to me now that as long as monsieur de bourbon remains prime minister you will confide to no soul alive that you have seen your father that you have this night even left the palace think take time reflect before you engage yourself madame i swear by everything most holy by my father's life and by my own soul that never while monsieur de bourbon remains prime minister shall any living creature know that i have seen my father or even left the palace this night enough hold yourself ready to go at a moment's warning i shall immediately order a carriage to be brought round for you and at six o'clock in the morning you must be back by the little postern gate of the park how have i deserved this goodness i sincerely feel for you pity and admire you my dear child in a few moments all will be prepared and i will come myself for you exit i shall see him again to-night this very night my father my dear dear father servant announcing monsieur le chevalier d'aubigny d'aubigny and for the first time in my life i have a secret that i may not share with him show him in enter d'aubigny dear henry what good fortune has befallen you gabrielle you look beaming with joy my heart is full of hope henry for since my arrival here all things seem to combine to favour and forward my wishes oh we shall save my father we shall save my brothers and the happiness of our love will be made perfect by their freedom thank heaven by your cheerfulness instead of accusing it by your despondency as for me i can tell you no more but i pray i believe and i hope tis sad that when you are so full of happy confidence i should be chilled with cold misgivings you look at everything through the medium of hope and i through that of fear you speak of all these fortunate circumstances which you say impart this cheerful faith to you in me they awaken nothing but suspicion and mistrust you think them ordered by a beneficent providence i tremble lest they should be the result of evil human machinations it may be morbid feeling an infirmity but gabrielle tis an infirmity as painful and as pitiable believe me as a real misfortune henry you are ungrateful to providence just now too above all and what has providence done for you now gabrielle tell me that god knows i desire nothing half so much as to hope on whom do you place your dependence for happier days and brighter prospects on madame de valcourt in the first place whose kindness and tenderness towards me are more those of a sister even than a friend why you see yourself that she has not allowed me to remain at a hotel a mother could hardly be more anxiously careful of her daughter i cannot help it gabrielle these painful impressions are not always to be controlled even by reason have you mentioned our engagement to madame de valcourt no is it not a secret true true but tell me have you seen no one but the marchioness to-day oh yes henry i have a person on whose influence i reckon even more than madame de valcourt may i know the name of this person of course that is no secret tis the duke de richelieu the duke de richelieu what is the matter good gracious the duke de richelieu and so you have seen him to-day why he has hardly left the palace all day and what was he doing here pray i believe he was engaged in particular business with monsieur de bourbon are you to see him again yes i expect him to bring me some account of a measure he intended taking about my petition gabrielle heavens you terrify me do you know this man to whom you have ventured to address yourself i know him as everybody knows him who does not know the duke de richelieu and knowing him can you hope that the protection he is now granting you is disinterested henry perhaps i am to blame but i must confess i cannot thus see nothing but evil in what appears unmixed good 
Monsieur de Richelieu has hitherto dealt by me as a sincere friend. Should he assume any other manner towards me, I presume that you have sufficient confidence in me to feel assured that all powerful as his grace's interest is, I shall relinquish all claim to it from the moment that I perceive it might compromise my honor, or a name which I am about to exchange for yours. Your innocence, Gabrielle, blinds you to this man's real character. The whitest virtue has been blackened but breathed on by his love. No fame survives unstained his contaminating touch. His evil determination once taken, he leaves no means unattempted to obtain his object, and some of the means that he has dared to use might have cost dear to men less powerful than that wicked man. Gabrielle, you see my agony. Have pity on me. What must I do? Speak, speak, Henry. Anything, everything you wish. Promise me not to receive the Duke here this evening. I promise you. Not to meet him anywhere else. I promise you. Gabrielle, I depend on your word. Henry, you are right to do so. If you were to break it, you do not know. You cannot conceive the misery that would fall upon us both. How? I cannot explain myself, but you have promised me, you do promise me, that you will not see the Duc de Richelieu tonight, do you not? I have promised it. I do promise it. Are you satisfied? Yes. Then, Henry, leave me. So soon? It is late. Tis hardly ten o'clock. I have some letters to write. I am weary. And besides, is it fitting for my sake that you should stay later here? You were to have received the Duc de Richelieu if he had come. The Duc de Richelieu is a stranger, an indifferent person. I do not love the Duc de Richelieu, and I do love you, Henry. You love me, and you dismiss me thus, when without the slightest impropriety I might remain with you an hour yet? An hour? It's impossible, Henry. Leave me, I beseech you. You beseech me to go away. Good God, what is going on? What is the matter? What has happened? Nothing is going on. Nothing has happened. Nothing is the matter. Is it then so very, very strange that after traveling all night and a day of anxiety and fatigue, I should wish to take some repose? Can it be possible that you are jealous, Henry? Why, of whom? Of what? I never saw you thus before. There, there. There. It is actually striking ten o'clock. I leave you, madame. Madame? Ah, that was cruel. You find me hopeful, happy. And as you are not used to see me thus, my unaccustomed cheerfulness alarms you, and you would fain make me sad again, sad as you have always seen me. Tis easily done, believe me. One word, one tone from you, one look of doubt or of distress. See, Henry, I am as sad as you could wish to make me. Are you satisfied? Pardon, Gabrielle, pardon. I love you so that I dare not believe my own happiness. I dread lest anything should come between us, should disunite us. Forgive me. I am going. I am wrong. Tomorrow, Henry. At what time tomorrow will you see me? As early as you like. At eight o'clock. Good night. Good night. You will not see the Duke. No, no. Go in peace. Farewell. Exit. Oh, he is gone at length. How hard to send him thus away without telling him what made me so happy. Madame! Madame! Enter Madame de Valcourt. Now then, here is the letter. The horses are too. The carriage is at the door. Which way must I go? Follow Mariette. Remember the most profound secrecy. And farewell, my dear child. Heaven bless and reward you. Runs out. <sighs> Tis something to have saved that gentle and innocent creature from even a knowledge of the foul machinations by which she was threatened. She is gone at length. A quarter after ten. It was high time. I am sure my husband must be already on his way hither. Let us take all due precautions against his entrance. Rings. A servant enters. Fasten the shutters of that window. And yet he does not care for this girl. I know he does not. But like a wanton child, seizing a butterfly and throwing it the next moment from him, maimed and defaced he pursues this wager for the sole gratification of his senseless vanity careless alike of her present feelings 
or her future fate to servant do you see any one in the street yes my lady a man wrapped in a cloak <laughs> a cloak in june it must be he fasten the window mademoiselle de belle isle is very nervous you will sit up all night in the anteroom and you will admit nobody till tomorrow morning servant goes out very good for further security let us bolt the doors there are the chimneys to be sure but they are grated at the top servant speaking through the door the duke de richelieu is coming up the great staircase my lady say that nobody is up listening servant without yes your grace everybody is retired excellent he retires too we shall no doubt soon hear something at that window now my dear husband i have kept faith with you and you have nothing to complain of i have not betrayed you to mademoiselle de belle isle i left her at ten o'clock and from ten o'clock till midnight she will most certainly be alone on the king's highway it is true but then it is your business to follow and find her there <laughs> but hark what noise was that from behind the tapestry footsteps the opening of a door heavens there is a secret entrance to the chamber and he knows it blows out the candles enter richelieu when one door is shut in your face the only way is to come in by some other madame de valcourt aside oh what shall i do what will become of me if i call for help the house will be roused was ever woman was ever wife in so strange a position i have but one course to be silent at least he is my husband what a capital thing is good memory faith the private staircase and the secret door don't seem to have been much used lately they're confoundedly dirty and out of repair however here we are safe and sound all is dark and still nothing could be better i have taken the precaution of writing my note beforehand as i came by i passed a fellow wrapped in a cloak lurking close under the wall no doubt my friend d'aubigny clock strikes half past ten he is at his post and i at mine and now to fulfil the conditions of our wager opens window softly hello you sir in the cloak there look here have the kindness to step this way if you please there that'll do if you should happen to be acquainted with the chevalier d'aubigny have the goodness to deliver this note to him from the duc de richelieu there it is throws note from window and closes shutters i met the marchioness's carriage on the way she is off to paris mademoiselle belle is by this time alone so now or never end of the second act act three of mademoiselle de belle isle by alexandre dumas translated by francis n campbell eighteen o nine to eighteen ninety three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Act three, scene one, the same scene as in the previous acts. Daubigny and the footman. But bless me, sir, tis only seven o'clock, and not a soul in the house is up yet. Never mind, I tell you, I will go in. I will speak to Mademoiselle de Belle as soon as she rises. Footman goes out can he be here still i watched till daybreak but i have not seen him come gracious god it seems like all a dream a hideous dream but no tis all but too true here is the very chamber where i left her yesterday the window out of which he threw his infernal boast the street where i received it merciful heavens can i believe my own senses gabrielle deceive me thus infamously oh no 
no no it is it must be impossible enter mademoiselle de belleisle dear henry i heard your voice and made haste to come to you so early up <laughs> you said last night that you would come early true but but uh, how comes it that last night you were so anxious to have me gone and that this morning you are so eager to receive me so you have not forgotten that yet henry no one cannot always banish painful impressions at will and that idea has tormented me throughout the night tormented you what idea oh why the recollection of that excessive fatigue of yours which made you so earnestly desire my absence you answer me very strangely this morning henry you seem troubled displeased what is it dearest what ails you tell me nothing nothing i cannot address the same remark to you your face wears an expression of joy of happiness perhaps you have fresh reasons for hope this morning oh yes if dreams may be supposed to augur anything mine have presaged me happiness this night i dreamt that a beneficent spirit bore me on his wings to the gates of the bastille which flew open before me i beheld my father he pressed me on his heart he folded me in his arms he rained kisses on my head he spoke to me of you dearest henry of our marriage so long so sadly deferred and he comforted himself in his captivity with the thought that i should soon have in you a friend and a protector oh you see dear love twas a wonderful dream and one that even now awake as i am fills my mind with the happiest hopes i too had a dream last night but uh, a less happy one than yours gabrielle is it that that makes you so sad this morning perhaps for i dreamt that yesterday i had no sooner left you than in spite of your solemn promise to me you did receive the duc de richelieu here what do you mean nothing you have told me your dream and i am telling you mine that's all well what then it seemed to me still in my dream that i was standing in the street opposite to that window when the window was thrown open and a man appeared on the balcony and threw out to me a note but stranger than all and which causes my dream to leave even a deeper impression of reality than yours perhaps is that on waking that note that very note was in my hand gabrielle and here it is and here it is read it mademoiselle de belle isle reads it is eleven at night i am in mademoiselle de belle isle's apartment i will tell you to-morrow at what hour i left it duke de richelieu what does that mean it means madame that monsieur de richelieu yesterday morning as you passed through the gallery laid an infamous wager which he has won i don't understand you then i will make myself understood you promised not to receive monsieur de richelieu you did receive him he came last night after i had left you monsieur de richelieu was with you in this room monsieur de richelieu opened that window and out of that window threw this note now do you understand what are you talking about what you know quite as well as i do only what you did not know is that i was aware of all that i was there under that window till break of day waiting to see him come out for your honour is yet too dear for me to leave such a secret in the possession of another man besides myself ah that was why you were so agitated and confused yesterday evening that was why you were so anxious so earnest to have me gone that was why you wished so very particularly to be left alone alone i have passed the whole night wandering round the palace for if i could but have found a door a window open any avenue that might have led to you i would have murdered you both yes both you and your lover with you though you had dragged yourself on your knees at my very feet for mercy you must be mad to utter such things to me i received monsieur de richelieu after you had left me monsieur de richelieu passed the night here 
Why can I believe my ears? My eyes? Are you the Chevalier d'Aubigny? Am I Mademoiselle de Belle Isle? Is it you? You, Henry, who speak thus to me, your betrothed. To me, who in three days shall bear your name. I can't believe my senses. I could not believe my senses. I thought my very eyes deceived me. Yes, Gabrielle, yes, such was my deep reliance on your truth, that I should have disbelieved my eyes and doubted still. But this paper, this paper is no illusion. Gabrielle, how will you account for this? What can I say to you? I can't account for it, even to myself. Someone must have entered this apartment without my knowing it. Without your knowing it? A man can have entered this room without your hearing him. Which way? Who admitted him? The doors are carefully watched. Even now it was with difficulty that I obtained entrance. Oh, Gabrielle, Gabrielle, I will account for this. I will tell you what has happened. Your love for your father has made you forget your love for me. You saw before you two men, one of whom had in his power your father's liberty. The other had nothing but his own life to offer you. The man of influence sold his protection to you at a certain price. Sir! Gabrielle, I accuse you of nothing. You are not, you cannot be guilty. I only say that you did not dare refuse the duke the meeting he solicited. I say, I only say, that you did consent to receive him, perhaps, and in some moment, when you may have left the room, he wrote this note and threw it from the window. That's all, Gabrielle, that's all. Confess that. Say it was so. Say so. And I forgive you. Thank you for that word, Henry. Thank you for these suggestions of your love, for I see that you love me so much that you are striving to deceive yourself, but I cannot confess what you require of me. If after the sacred promise that I gave you I had consented to see Monsieur de Richelieu, I should be infamous. But believe me, he solicited no meeting. I granted him none. I have not seen him, I tell you so again, and I have the simplest means in my power of proving what I say. What means? This note is from the Duke, you say. He threw it to me from the window himself. I shall send immediately for Monsieur de Richelieu. You will conceal yourself there. I shall receive him here. You will not lose a single syllable of what passes between us. And if Monsieur de Richelieu has seen my face since yesterday evening at eight o'clock, then... Why then, Henry, you shall think of me as vilely as you please. Oh, dearest, I had not dared to ask this much of you. But since you offer it... I accept the means of clearing up this infamous mystery, which baffles me. Calm yourself. The mystery shall be cleared up, believe me. Only, Henry, remember, not a motion, not a word, that might betray your concealment. Oh, fear me not. Madman? No, no, I am convinced. I do not doubt thee. No, tis impossible, with that angelic voice, those lovely eyes. No. No, you cannot tell a falsehood. I believe thee, dearest, dearest. You will believe me better still when I shall have sent for the Duke. The servant announces. The Duke de Richelieu. Tis heaven sends him at this moment. Show him in. And do you enter that chamber, and above all remember your promise, Henry, to be silent. Your hand, Gabrielle. My hand? You deserve... Give me your hand. He kisses her hand and goes into her room. Richelieu enters. You come upon a wish, my lord duke. Hail to my fairest. I came indeed, but almost without a hope of being admitted thus early. Sir, I was about to send for you. Richelieu, attempting to kiss her hand. Ah, you are too, too gracious. My lord duke. Fair lady. I have a most serious explanation to demand of you. An explanation, sir, in which my honour is deeply concerned. Your honour, madam? And who dares attack it? I am here to defend both it and you. Speak, therefore, I entreat you. The question is of a certain wager, which I understand your grace laid yesterday. Bless me, madam, since the truth must be told. I own it. There was such a wager. But believe me, 
I was devoted to you long before any such question arose. From the first moment of beholding you, I felt that my heart was no longer my own. I followed you from Paris to Versailles, from Versailles to Chantilly. You, you alone drew me hither, I swear it. This wager was proposed to me by two other scapegraces like myself. You were not the object of it, believe me. Your name was not even uttered in the agreement. The first woman who passed was the person concerned in the bet. You were that person. My honour was engaged in the winning of my wager. It so happened that my love, too, was most deeply interested in its success. This, madam, is the truth. If I have sinned against you, believe me, the crime was not premeditated, and pardon me. My lord duke, I pardon you, hard though it be, and you yourself, I think, must acknowledge it to be so. When one has lost rank, station, fortune, when from the wreck of all one has rescued nothing but a stainless reputation, confess it, sir, tis a cruel thing to see that reputation, which should be respected as a holy possession, bandied from hand to hand by dissolute idlers, who, unable to attack it, dare thus attempt to trifle it away. Nevertheless, my lord duke, in favour of all that you have done for me, though now I know the source of that kindness, which I had supposed disinterested, pure, and noble, I pardon you this cruel and insulting wager, but upon one condition, however, that you will explain to me how, last night, this note was thrown from that window between ten and eleven o'clock. Read it, sir. Read it. That were useless. I know its contents. You know them? Why? Is not the handwriting mine? If I were inclined to deny it, the signature is there at the bottom. You wrote this note. I acknowledge it. You threw it from that window. Even so. And to whom? My dear madam, how the deuce should I know? To the person who was waiting for it, I presume. You were here last night, here in this chamber. Most certainly. But you were here without me? What? What, without you? Do you dare to say that you were here with me? Why, most indubitably. With me? Of course. My lord duke, tis a lie. A lie? An infamous lie. My dear madam, when a woman uses that sort of language to a man, he has nothing for it but to leave her presence. You shall not stir, my lord. What, because your name is Richelieu, because you are a thrice noble duke and peer of the realm, do you think, sir, that it shall be permitted you for the sake of a pitiful wager, in which you fancy your honour compromised, to libel a woman? And when that woman has lost everything in this world but the love of an honest man whom she loves, to make her by your vile calumnies forfeit that best, most precious treasure? Sir, sir, I appeal to your ancient name, to your noble station, to your honour, my lord duke, which is disgracefully losing its way. I appeal to you, sir, and you will retract what you have said. You will do me right. You will bear witness to the truth. The truth. Yes, my lord, here before me, whom you have so deeply injured, and you will hesitate the less to do me this tardy justice, because I am but a poor, helpless, defenceless woman who claim it at your hands. Upon my soul, you almost persuade me that I am in the wrong. I suppose I ought to have pretended to lose my wager. Come, what can I do? Shall I write to the Chevalier? I can tell him, you know, that I found the doors all shut here last night, and that therefore, of course, the note I threw out of the window means nothing at all. Shall I tell him that I have lost my bet? In short, what shall I do, say or write? For God forbid that my absurd vanity should be the means of breaking off a match on which you say your happiness depends. I would rather sacrifice my own. Certainly I owe you no less. My lord duke, the wickedness of what you are now saying passes all belief. Tis fiendish. No, sir, no, no, I ask no letter, I want no writing. What I demand, what I insist upon is, a confession now here, this very instant, that every word you have uttered hitherto is false, and that in uttering them you have despised truth, disregarded your name, and disgraced your honour. You shall confess, sir, that all you have said was a slander, a base, cowardly slander. I cannot stop to choose my words, I speak those that my indignation prompts me with. You shall confess this, sir, and though I dare not promise then that you will escape my contempt, you may at all events rest assured of my forgiveness. Richelieu, whispering, Now why the devil couldn't you make me understand, all this time that we were overheard, that someone was concealed? No one is concealed, sir. 
No one overhears us. There is no one here but myself. Answer then to me. I demand it. Then, if indeed no one is here but you, if indeed I am to reply to you alone, I will confess that I thought myself pretty well versed in the arts of your most subtle sex, instead of which I find myself a mere tiro in the science. Every day they teach me something new. To me, who every day think I can learn nothing fresh upon that subject. Moreover, I must further confess that to you was reserved the honour of giving me the most complete lesson in this kind that I have yet received in all my life. Enough, my lord duke. Leave me. I obey, madam. Not without a hope, however, that when I present myself again this evening, which I shall do at the same hour when you condescended to receive me yesterday, I may be more welcome than I have appeared this morning. Exit. Great God, is it possible? Daubigny, coming from her room. Well, madame. Oh, oh, oh. I have obeyed you. I concealed myself. I listened. I heard. And in spite of it all, I kept my word and did not appear. I hope you are satisfied. Henry. Daubigny, going. Leave me. Henry, hear me. Yes, you were right to fear and warn me yesterday. Yes, yes, your forebodings were all but too true. Yes, some fatality seems to conspire against us both. Both, for it strikes you as well as me, Henry. But, oh, you shall not leave me thus. There is some horrible machination in all this. An invisible hatred, proceeding from I know not whence, seems to enfold and stifle me, Henry. It cannot be that at once suddenly my voice has lost its power over your heart. Henry, you cannot... Cannot believe it possible that in one hour I have forgotten the principles of a whole life. Henry, it is impossible that in a single day I should have become lost and infamous. Good God, why, if someone were to come and swear to me that you had committed a crime or a cowardice, fled in battle or murdered in secret? No, 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 Henry, I should not, I could not, I would not believe it. To the purpose, madame, the duke, it seems, was here last night. I don't deny it. From this room he passed into the next apartment. He may have done so. Oh, you confess it, do you, at last? Yes, I confess that. But you do not know. You cannot know. Then I must infer that you were not in this room. Then you passed the night elsewhere, it seems. Henry, I have taken a terrible oath. I can tell you nothing. Henry, I have sworn merciful heavens is there no one who to save us both from madness can relieve you from this cursed oath yes yes you are right heaven inspired you with the thought oh yes when she sees of what horror i am accused she will surely let me tell you all and then you will see you will know rings mariette enters madame de valcourt the marchioness where is she pray inform her that i wish to speak with her instantly and that I entreat her to come without a moment's delay. Go, go. Her ladyship went to Paris this morning with the Duke de Bourbon, and will only return in time for the ball this evening. Exit. Why, then, it is a fatality, a horrible fatality. Henry, wait till this evening. This evening you shall know all. He's going. She stops him. Henry, do not leave me. Henry, I swear to you. You are right. It is a fatality. Yesterday at noon, you leave your hotel to come and reside in the palace. Yesterday evening, I came, and, for the first time, my presence disturbs and troubles you, and you desire me to leave you. You solemnly swear to me that you will not receive the duke. As my feet leave the threshold, he enters your apartment. For the last hour, you have been denying that he came at all, and now you confess not only that he came but that it is possible that he may have remained here till three o'clock in the morning you say you were not in this chamber and you cannot tell me where you were you are bound by an oath you have sworn a sacred pledge compels you to silence one person however can remit this oath one person only and that person has left chantilly oh you are right it is a fatality no doubt a strange fatality so strange indeed that it passes all belief 
and I declare to you, madame, that I do not believe it. What can I say to you, Henry? Yes, every proof is against me. Yes, if my life were at stake, my life would be forfeited, as I fear my honor will. But were my head this moment on the block, I would not break my oath. You must act according to your conviction, Henry. Go. I detain you no longer. Falls into a chair. Daubigny goes towards door. Hear me, Gabrielle. I know that that man has mysterious and inscrutable means of accomplishing his vile purposes. Confess, then, he gave you some potion, some narcotic, some accursed poisoned draught. Confess it. He entered here while you were still under its influence, and you did not awake till too late. Say this, confess this, and my love for you shall be the same as ever, and you shall still be mine, mine when I have murdered that villain. Oh, Gabrielle, confess this, for even this is better. I can understand, I can believe, I can forgive this. But tell me no more of unaccountable absences and incredible oaths. Oh, heavens! see how i love you see how i cling to my trust in you the way i offer you is easy i give you myself a ready excuse if you have deceived me if you are really guilty take in pity take advantage of the pretext my very love has given you say say he resorted to stratagem to violence say he alone is guilty my vengeance shall fall on him alone in the name of god have mercy on me and say something that i can believe that i can imagine true unless you would have me go mad here at your feet and die cursing you and heaven in the name of god upon my knees gabrielle i implore you to speak speak have mercy on me speak i cannot utter an untruth even for you henry i have not seen the duke de richelieu since yesterday evening at eight o'clock this is too much and now my course is clear i implore you leave me madame leave me henry henry have mercy for the last time will you confess the truth i have done so then heaven may forgive you, but I never will. Rushes out. Mademoiselle de Belle falling on her knees. Oh, God, have pity on me. End of the third act.